Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Haydn Symphony Crusade. Yes, I finally cleared the previous three copyright claims, and so we can move on to the next symphony. I may not care after a while. You know, when you've got like 2,800 videos, I mean, what's a few? <laughs> what are a few copyright claims among friends? Anyway, this is symphony number 51 in B flat. An extraordinary work, as are all of these middle period Haydn symphonies, full of questing spirit and experimentation, all within a witty and entertaining orchestral framework. Now, to the extent this symphony is discussed at all, um, which it almost never is, it's famous for having the highest note ever written for the French horn, or something like that, or one of them. I mean, even those crazy Baroque pieces aren't like higher, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now, the reason Haydn does that is because the horns are in B-flat alto. That means the high octave in B-flat, but they're also in the low octave. And so we're going to have to talk about that. One of the things that people don't mention when they talk about these, aside from the fact that the horn parts are incredibly difficult and ferociously virtuosic, is that Haydn unifies the symphony simply by timbre with the sound of those high horns. And because he has these high horns, he doesn't really have to worry about having thematic relationships between the movements or other things like that, motivic relationships. But he does actually do that too, in a special way that we'll talk about in a moment. One of the things that I think is so important to wrap your brain around is that Haydn conceived his symphonies as holes, as, I mean, his biographer said so. He told his biographer he did. I'm not making that up. I mean, that is true. From the very beginning, his multi-movement works were conceived as a unity, as an integrated sequence of movements representing different emotional states and different expressive things. And, you know, it's all intentional. And it's intentional in a way that Haydn expects us to be able to hear, even at a first shot. You hear those high horns at a first shot, but there are also subtleties that will become apparent later. One of the things that I think has made these symphonies so difficult for people to evaluate and to give them the credit they deserve for their like just astonishingly inexhaustible genius is exactly this fact that that unity is sometimes operating simply on a timbral level. I mean, we just I just talked about this in a video about whether contemporary audiences understood symphonic forms. And I mean, the answer is, of course they did. They understood what they heard, more or less. But later, later generations of analysts who discussed these works learned them not by listening to them, as Haydn wrote them in orchestral guard because they weren't performed. They, 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 heard, they learned them by looking at scores or playing them on the piano, stripped of all of their orchestral coloring. But Haydn was one of the greatest ever orchestral colorists. Rimsky-Korsakov called him the greatest symphonic orchestrator before Rimsky-Korsakov, which was saying quite a lot. It really was, and Haydn was. He was discovering the possibilities of the orchestra and, and of ways to write large works and unify large works simply on the basis of sound, of the ensemble sound. And this is one of those symphonies because you've got those high horns in every movement. Now, they're not as prominent in the first movement as they would become later. They would become a lot more you know, soloistic in the other movements. But they're there in the first movement, and they gradually emerge in the second movement and the minuet and the finale. And so we have a wonderful four movement unity um, in which the most obvious unifying element is the sound of the French horns. However, there is another element, and that's one that I really would like to focus on um, as we discuss this work because it's incredibly fascinating. You know, people don't give Haydn credit as often as not for being the, the formal genius. Well, yeah, they do give him credit for being a formal genius, but the ways that he's a formal genius. You know, they say, oh, he's a formal genius, and we're supposed to just take that as given, but we're not supposed to hear how. And this is one of those symphonies where it's particularly interesting to hear how he's a formal genius, because the way in which he's a formal genius is the fact that the music 
is continually developmental. That is, it never stops ringing changes on the initial thematic material. And it does it in every possible way in all of these movements. And that's one of the things that's just so amazingly fascinating about it. The first movement, for example, we're going to have some musical examples, and I can make it very clear what's going to happen. You have an exposition which gives you the basic thematic elements. And those basic thematic elements are very, very clear. There's a an opening fanfare, bum ba da da dum, ba ba da da dum, ba dum ba dum, bum bum, really memorable, really distinctive and memorable. So every time it comes back, you're going to recognize it, and you're going to think that Haydn's going back to the beginning. But sometimes he isn't, sometimes he doesn't. In the middle of this movement, the development section, he returns to it in what they call a fausse reprise, a fake recapitulation, the fake reprise, where he makes you think, okay, it's developed, and now we're back at the beginning. But it doesn't go back to the beginning. It goes somewhere else. And there's a whole other developmental business shenanigans. And Haydn disguises the actual recapitulation by playing his ideas in reverse. So you're not really sure where the recapitulation starts. That's what makes it so much fun. It's incredibly cool. And so in doing that, he simply rewrites the entire exposition because it's being played backwards. Um, and all the same material comes out, but it's all in a different order and it's, and it's jumbled up together and bits of it are of the second subject are interspersed with the first subject. If this all sounds very complicated, it isn't. When you hear it, it's incredibly clear and, and perfectly, perfectly delightful. I mean, it's so much fun to listen to once you know the thematic material. So I'm going to play you the exposition, then we're going to hear the fake reprise, and then we're going to hear the actual moment of recapitulation that goes all the way to the end of the movement. And you're just going to, it's delicious. And it's even better when you hear the whole thing continuously without me just playing excerpts, right? because you'll, you'll, you'll hear the, the ingenuity um, with which Haydn manipulates the material. That's part of the fun. What makes the fake reprise effective is the fact that there's been a lot of developmental stuff before it. What makes the recapitulation so much fun is that it sneaks in somewhat, somewhat unannounced, but not really. It's, it's recognizable for what it is. And then you, you hear the things in reverse order. So all of that stuff is very, 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 very clear. Haydn wants you to hear it and to enjoy it. And to say, oh, aha, isn't that cool? Isn't that fun to recognize these, these formal strategies for what they are, which is sources of surprise, amusement, entertainment, expression, all of those things. And he does it by manipulating the form. And as a result of that, you know, the textbook examples of sonata form are seldom applicable to Haydn at any point in his career because he allowed the musical material to dictate the course of each movement. And he was never, never, and he never tires of experimenting and arranging things in new and astonishing ways. So let's hear the exposition of Haydn Symphony Number no. 51. Listen for those high horns in the orchestral texture. They don't do a lot of solo stuff at this point, but you will tell. They add a tension and a brilliance to the orchestral sound. Now this is um, who's doing this? It's the Swedish Chamber Orchestra under Bella Drahos on Naxos. And my goodness, it's a very fine performance. So here is the exposition. Um, two very, very clear main themes. The second, just so you know, is da da ba da do 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 da da do 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 da da do 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 It's just little two-note things tossed back and forth in the various orchestral sections, just so you know what it sounds like when it arrives. So here's the whole thing. <laughs>
right, there's your exposition. I'm sure you heard that second subject. The reason Haydn makes his thematic ideas in this thing so clear and different from each other is so that you can follow the course of the development. So the first part of the development is basically about the first subject, the first theme, um, that fanfare, and then the stuff that comes after the fanfare. And then it, right where you least expect it, in comes the what you think is going to be the recapitulation. But as you will hear, it's only the first part. After that, there's another big, furious, furious tutti, big passage for the whole orchestra. Um, and here it is. <laughs> See how that's a fake out? You think the symphony's starting over and then it goes, whoop, no, that way. And at the very end of that passage, just a tiny bit I only played, you hear the second subject come in in a minor key. Da da, boo doo, da da, doo doo, you know, that thing. And that is going to lead to the actual recapitulation, which begins with the soft answer. Right, ba ba da da dum, ba ba da da dum, ba dum ba dum, bum bum. That is da 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 da. You know that soft bit. That's where the recapitulation begins. So we're going to hear the lead in and recapitulation um, of the symphony going all the way to the end, and you'll hear how the material of the exposition, all of these different ideas, the fanfare, the soft answer, the loud outburst that it leads to, the second subject, all of that stuff gets gets recombined in what's effectively an entirely new development of all of this material, even though it does the job of a recapitulation, which is to reestablish tonal stability, that is to return to our home key and give a sense of fulfillment um, that, that Haydn is getting us back home where, where we belong. But there's an extra sense in that because you see the textbook example of sonata form says, well, he shows you that we're getting home just by repeating everything all over again, but all in the same key. There's more to Haydn than that. And the more is that we're not just home, but he's worked the material to the point where you feel satisfied that he's done everything that he could do with that material while bringing us home at the same time. So you get two for the price of one. That's the extra, the something extra that Haydn always has in his view of what you might call classical sonata form. The potential to do something novel and fascinating right up to the very end. So here's the actual recapitulation leading to the end of the movement. <laughs> So there you go. Now the slow movement. Oh, the slow movement. The slow movement has 
the horns going completely crazy. There are two horns. Now, traditionally, one horn would play the higher notes and the second horn would play the lower notes. And that's true of horn writing up to the present day. If you have four horns, traditionally in an orchestra, they're generally scored one, three, two, four. And one and three do the higher parts and two and four do the lower parts. That's normal horn writing in symphonic music. Haydn only has two horns, so he's got a higher one and a lower one. And this is hilarious. The opening theme is a horn solo that's as high as you can go. And then the answer, because there's an answer, remember, call and answer. That was the opening of the whole symphony. And this symphony has this, this movement, this slow movement, has the same shape. There's a horn call and a quieter answer. But the answer in this case is the second horn playing the lowest possible notes in the horn. And people don't talk about the low notes. But the range of the French horn is astonishing. It has what's called what are called pedal tones. You could play way, way down low. Um, and that's just as difficult, particularly in a soft dynamic where you really have to control the sound. Um, it's just as difficult as playing the high, high, high notes. It's really, really hard to get those notes. And so you've got you've got this initial theme and then this really low answer that's it's funny. It's really witty. It's, it's deliciously funny to hear these huge ranges um, on, on, in the horn family. So we're going to play the exposition, the entire exposition of the movement. Um, and then I want you to hear the recapitulation because you're going to hear something marvelous. Trust me. So here is the opening. And listen to those low horn notes. Going blah, 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 like that. It's just... And if you want to laugh, laugh. Haydn wants you to. It's funny music, but a slow movement. And it's a, people take it terribly seriously. But the sounds are so eccentric. It's so weird. And that's the joy of it. Here you go. All right, so there's the exposition. Now, this movement is in sonata form like the first movement, and there is a recapitulation. Now, you'll remember, in the first movement, the recapitulation completely recomposed the material of the exposition. Well, so does this, but it does it in a different way. In the first movement, he played the opening subject in reverse with its elements backward. He doesn't do it that way here. Here, what he does is he breaks them up. So you had the opening horn solo, which comes back here with even more high notes attached to it. And then you had those low notes. But here he waits. The answer is different. He allows us to hear all kinds of other material until at the very end, he brings in those low notes for the last time with some embroidery from the rest of the orchestra on top. So there's this, this interstitial space 
that gets filled. And as a result of that, you know, the recapitulation is longer than the exposition. Haydn is a master of concision. Normally, these things are really rather, rather, rather compressed, and he'll he'll shorten his recapitulations. But in this case, he's extending them because he wants to do more development. And here we have the listen for the horn theme, which is obvious, and then those low notes, but all the stuff that comes in the middle. So he, the recapitulation also doubles as a second development, just as in the first movement, but differently done. Hear that? That's genius. Genius at work. It's incredible. Now, the third movement um, is a minuet, and minuets are very simple in form, right? They're A, B, A. So how is Haydn going to work with this, this, this idea of ongoing development? Well, he does it. He does it by having two trio sections, middle sections, as we call them. So the form of this minuet is A, B, A, C, A. It has two middle sections, which is very rare in Haydn. Haydn doesn't usually do minuets with two trios. Mozart does them much more frequently. Um, but in this case, he does it, and he does it for two reasons. The first trio is entirely for strings. The second trio is mostly for the horns and winds. And this is the part that has the highest note ever for the horn in it. It goes way, 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 way up there. But the point that's so interesting about it is that the second trio is a variation of the music of the first trio. So they are related. They're related thematically. And I'm not going to play both trios. You can go and listen to it for yourself. I want to play the second trio with the insane horn notes leading to the return of the minuet, the final return, just so you get a sense of it. So you can hear the incredible horn writing. And then you can go back and listen to the version of the trio at your leisure that has just the strings and you can hear how they're related to each other in terms of the shape and cut and thrust of the melody. And so Haydn, even in this very simple dance form, is, is actually pursuing his idea of ongoing development and variation, but in a completely ingratiating and charming way, as always with Haydn. He doesn't ever do these things in a dry way. They're done in a way that's so completely delicious, just incredible. So here is the second trio leading back to the minuet in the end of the movement. <laughs>
now, what's Haydn going to do for the finale? Well, the finale is a summary of sort of everything that we've had before. It's a variation rondo. Now, a variation rondo, a rondo is a movement which basically had the same form as the minuet, A, B, A, C, A, basically. That's a basic rondo. But if you vary the return of the A section, each time it comes back, you make it sound a little bit different, then you have a variation rondo. And Haydn wrote these things uh, quite a few times. It's a jolly movement in moderate tempo, very sectional, so that you hear the fact that the development is ongoing with each return of the rondo theme. I'm going to play you just the end. Let me see if I have here. If I have the opening? Yes, I do. I have the opening for you, the opening theme, and then the last appearance, which gives you-know-who, the horns, an opportunity to go completely nuts for the last time in the symphony leading to the end. So here is the opening rondo theme, a very simple and relaxed tune. Now this tune is offset by a couple of contrasting episodes, and then it comes back in a variation. Then there's a tense minor key episode, and then it comes back on the horns and leads to the coda that finishes the whole symphony. So here is the final return of the theme, the culmination of the whole symphony, a variant featuring the horns that brings the entire work to its incredibly triumphant but jolly and 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 ingratiating conclusion. <laughs> Now, I mean, it was wonderful, wasn't it? But here's the, here's the, here's the thing. These, these symphonies from what are called Haydn's Sturm und Drang period are famous for their minor key tensions and anxiety and the increase in you know, emotions of, of death and destruction and misery and apocalyptic fury and all that stuff. You know? But the ones that are in a happy, jolly major key are, are no less interesting and no less experimental and no less expressively varied. And this is a case in point because Haydn is exploring entirely new territory, but he's doing it with humor, with charm, with, with wit. You know, he can, he can do it, he can do anything. Haydn can just do anything. He's, he's just beyond remarkable. And the fact that these symphonies are almost never played and never discussed and never given the, the credit that they deserve to have for being just astonishingly forward thinking and fascinatingly varied, I just think is a crime. Ooh, that was a bug zapper, zapping a bug. I mean, it's really just, just unfortunate because people are missing so much. But the key, of course, is to know what to listen for. Happily, Haydn tells us when we listen to any one of these symphonies. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. Keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care. <laughs>